So I saw Joker and I was so relieved. I've had so little to say about proper clickbaity popular films that I was actually in the middle of drafting a video about the Dog's Purpose trilogy. Um, anyway, I didn't think it was very good. I mean, actually, I guess it was sort of good. I mean, it like, there are so many movies I like less than this. There is such a heavenly glow coming off my porg. I'm gonna move the camera a little bit. I'm trying to be more fair about my rating scale, which admittedly does just consist of good and bad. So anyway, since this was entertaining, I would like to designate it as good kind of, but I'd like to talk about it a little more. The setting, the time period, that's all really cool. Finally, someone is acknowledging that the old-timey, show-tune, dancing, clown man aesthetic just is kind of cool. But the story didn't really, like, do anything and back up. Before you get really angry, you'll still get angry. I'm not saying, oh, it's boring. Where's Batman? That's not my criticism at all. This whole movie kind of reads as one of those productions that like switched directors halfway through and they didn't get to complete their vision, which is not what it is at all. So that's bad. It has a pretty compelling setup. You like Arthur at the beginning. The things that make his life sad are generally pretty believable. But then the world around him just becomes so common mean in such an over-the-top way. Any of these weird sad incidents on their own, you'd kind of be like, okay, but they pile up so much that it just becomes absurd. A good example is the scene where his social worker tells him that he's no longer going to be able to receive therapy or check-ins or whatever those were supposed to be or medication because funding has been cut from the program. She tells him this and so okay, but then unprompted she's like, they don't care about people like you or people like me, which was kind of what the implication had been, but I guess the director didn't trust us to understand what was going on. And I assume that second half, the or people like me, was to try to kind of clumsily justify why she would volunteer this kind of angry statement. We're meant to understand her frustration that she can't help people at her job the way she wants to. But this line doesn't work because in all of their previous meetings, she's never like connected with Arthur. In fact, she barely listens to him, which is portrayed as part of the problem. Most of the time when he's talking and it cuts to her, she's just kind of looking at him in like bemusement or boredom. So why now would she say something as on the nose and inflammatory as this to this brooding unstable man who's about to be taken off his meds? It just feels clumsy and feels like it lowers the IQ of the whole movie that they have to tell you this in such certain terms. It also makes her a very weird character. We can't show her being very sympathetic to Arthur or connecting with him or really helping him because in order for the thesis statement of this movie to work, I guess everyone in every facet of Arthur's life has to be dismissive of him or wrong him in some way. Another good example is at the very beginning, he's hired out from his clown talent agency to go hold a sign at a store's close out sale. There's already a lot to unpack here. I'll be generous and skip right over Clown Talent Agency. I'm not a child of the 80s and for all I know, clowns really did have such a heyday back then that it justified operating clown talent agencies. I don't know. But if I may indulge in a brief, very nitpicky sidebar, why did the sign holder have to be a clown? Couldn't it just be any temp worker? If the job is only to hold a sign and the purpose of the clown costume is just to generate attention, to the person holding the sign, they wouldn't just an underqualified non-clown temp worker get you much better bang for your buck, especially if you're trying to save money because your store is going out of business. Does nowhere in this city rent clown costumes to non-clowns? And does this store owner not have like an unemployed nephew he could recruit for this task? But I digress. Arthur is holding this sign and he gets mugged by some hooligans. And to add insult to injury, they take his sign and they break it. And then Arthur, like probably a full week later, Later, gets yelled at by his boss because the store owner wants his sign back. What, you're going out of business sign? Isn't a sign like that by its very nature a sign that you only need for a limited amount of time? Anyway, I'm not auditioning for Cinema Sins here and I'm not counting that as like a, a real big strike against the movie. I just thought it was kind of funny. My beef is very unsurprising. It's the same as it always is. I don't like when movies carry themselves like they're very clever and like they have big themes and then fail to follow through and actually have well-developed themes. I was really pretty disappointed because I was actually pretty excited going in. The premise I was here for, the trailers I really liked. The trailers were very good. Can we just acknowledge that? This movie had two really solid trailers. Fortunately, I'm able to compartmentalize and when this happens, I can still go back 
and just enjoy a good trailer. Even if I like know that the movie didn't turn out being that good, I could just go back and watch the trailer and like remember how excited it made me feel. It's like an anime music video, like it's its own art. You're just like, hmm, nice trailer. <laughs> That's very sad. If you haven't seen it and for some reason you're watching this video, I assume everyone that clicked it clicked it because they like the movie and they like to feel anger for some reason. Anyway, on the off chance that you haven't seen it, let me break this down very quickly. Remember in the trailer they had all these compelling shots of like the Joker dancing in a grandiose fashion and they're playing like a Bing Crosby song or something. I'm 90% sure it's not Bing Crosby. Don't, don't get on my case about this. Anyway, you see those in the trailer and you get kind of hype because it feels like this kind of bombastic scene, maybe a, a emotional height for the Joker or a culmination of a lot of things that lead to him being on this staircase or backstage of this show and doing a grand little dance. You kind of assume it's not like triumphant given the overall tone of the movie, but that it's at least going to be some kind of cool standout scene. But the truth is the Joker isn't dancing in like an interesting moment as part of a bigger scene. He dances at several points in the movie actually in various settings and each time he does it there isn't really a build up to it. There's an unrelated scene that somehow indicates his descent into madness and then cut away to a different scene wherein he is dancing <laughs> in front of a mirror or on a staircase or backstage of the talk show and you're like Oh, and it's it's slow motion. It doesn't have fun like show tuny music the way it does in the trailer. It just has very somber strings. And each of these scenes is really sort of interchangeable with the other ones like it. I'm very here for like slow boring character studies, but it didn't feel slow and boring because it was intimate or because it was taking its time to really develop the character. It felt like it was slow and boring because Todd Phillips had like a couple ideas for good scenes and then just repeated them a lot. Like he was trying to pad the movie. Sad thing happens to Arthur. Shot of Arthur in a dim room, smoking and looking seriously at a wall. Shot of Arthur dancing in slow-mo, but you play violin music over it. Also, a scene of a man dancing doesn't automatically become poignant just because you slow it down and put spooky violins over it, especially when you do it more than once. And by the third or fourth time, it starts to just feel tiresome, like this could have been a half-hour movie for how little ground it covers. Okay, hold up, before I go farther, let me just like break down what I liked really quickly. They have a couple nods to the famous Joker story, I think this was all in the killing joke, where he says that anyone can go crazy if they just have one comically, exaggeratedly, monumentally bad day. They even have Arthur say at one point, I'm having a bad day. So, you know, that's all there. I noticed that. I don't know if I liked it. I noticed it. I liked this one sequence where Arthur goes to a movie house and they're watching this old Charlie Chaplin movie. I think it's the famous one that's like set in the Great Depression and he's like a downtrodden factory worker and there's like this major plot point where he keeps accidentally inciting these riots or uprisings. I think there's a, a major part where he says that he'd rather be in jail. Like it's a comedic thing where he's trying to get thrown back in jail because the living conditions there are better than they are outside. So as you've probably noticed, there are enough overt big plot echoes between the two stories that that's kind of cool. Unfortunately, if you want to look to that Charlie Chaplin movie as like an actual indicator of theme, it doesn't really work because like it is a comedy, it has a happy ending, uh, where I think it's just him like getting a girlfriend and going to make things work in the real world. So um, it's it's not like a one-one correlation. I just think it's kind of cool to reference an old movie, um, but I don't think it necessarily tied the whole thing together. I don't know that it was intended to though. I don't know, I'd call it like a little half-baked which isn't to say that it doesn't get points, it gets like exactly half points. It's half-baked, you know? A half-baked chocolate chip cookie is still pretty good. I really like the color scheme of the Joker's outfit. I don't know if this particular color scheme is lifted from some already existing incarnation of the Joker, but it's not familiar to me, I don't think. I'm used to like purple and green, so I thought it was good. Also, I'm going to praise the thing that everybody is praising, that Joaquin Phoenix's performance is really good. It was really good. There's not a lot to say about that. He does convincingly come off as somebody with some kind of social disorder and not just like a weird caricature like Eddie Redmayne in the Fantastic Beast movies. Sorry, I can't stop coming for the Fantastic Beast movies. And to give credit to the script as written, I actually also liked a lot of the character details you see of Arthur at the beginning, like the fact that he has a little lamp 
laminated card that he hands to people about his condition, and the scenes of him at the comedy club where he's trying to like sit at the back and write physical notes about what topic of joke is getting laughs because he just can't understand like the nuances of comedy and can't figure out how to relate to people. It's like your heart just really breaks for him in those scenes. I thought those were really good. There are all these scenes later that I think are going to be looked at as like his acting moments that I don't think indicate good acting. I think it's all in the subtle stuff at the beginning, but I'm sure everybody's gonna be like, oh, that scene where he's smoking and staring at the wall, or that scene where he's like contorting his body in a weird way to dance. And it's like contorting your body and doing exhausting things exhausting does not equal good acting and I think people conflate the two a lot. It's like that scene in Mamma Mia where Meryl Streep is doing the winner takes it all. The winner takes it all. The winner takes it all. She's just flailing her arms and her scarf everywhere and like wailing out the song and that was a well-received performance. Everybody's like, wow, she really went for it on that song. And it's like, okay. I used to think that my life was a tragedy. But now I realize it's a comedy. So what I'm saying is this was a similar performance. But no, I thought he was really good as Arthur. Even the end when I stopped liking the way Arthur was written and didn't think it was very consistent, you could feel Joaquin Phoenix trying to like keep it together and feel like the same character. Like the fact that as he's giving his big grandiose speech on the talk show, Joaquin Phoenix is still doing kind of a childish inflection. I thought that was really good. So thumbs up. It was good. But to go back to criticism, as I kind of just hinted at, I didn't think there was enough of a through line for his character the way it was written. And also, this is a character study, so this question should be important, but what are Arthur's motivations? They go ahead and give Arthur lines where he says he's not political, not trying to make a statement, etc. So if he's to be believed, which I understand is conditional, what does he want? Our best glimpses of what he wants are pretty obvious. They're in all of the delusions, the fantasy sequences he has. Uh, we can glean from the praise other characters give him what he would like to be or to be perceived as. He wants the talk show host he looks up to to validate him or almost be like a surrogate father. He wants people to say that he's funny, obviously, but there's one that's a little weird. This is the standout. It's something that his love interest says on one of the dates that he's imagining between them. She looks at the newsstand and sees the headlines about all the riots that Arthur's been inspiring by shooting the Wall Street guys, and she's like, I think that guy's a hero. So that leads us to believe that Arthur wants to be seen as a hero, one would assume. So that suggests that he does want to start a movement, he's happy that that happened, even if it wasn't his initial goal, and he wants to be like a hero or influential. And I'm not saying it's bad that he contradicts this later. I get that he's crazy. <laughs> that wasn't subtle. So sure, maybe he's not sure what he wants or he's being dishonest on the talk show. But at the same time, I'm pointing out that contradiction. So all of the dude bros who defend the movie and they're like, he said he's not political. Well, there are in-text contradictions for that. So there. In his fantasy sequence, when his girlfriend says he's a hero, he even like smiles to himself. It's very obvious. And like, I just wish that if that is what he wanted, it was reflected at all in his actions. Like he engaged with the mob in some other way than just breaking out of the cop car, seemingly by coincidence in the middle of the mob. I just wish there was a straighter line between like his actions and his motivations, you know, like some kind of character study. I get that the Joker is some kind of crazy supervillain, so he doesn't have to do things that like make sense to us or that we approve of, but they have to at least make some kind of internal sense. And if they don't, then he's not a good character to base the movie around. Like if you're gonna write this thing where the thing he wants is to be an entertainer or get public approval, it's not that hard to write a through line 
from that with him being a clown to him being a crazy murderer because murderers do get attention you could make it this whole media meta commentary like he kills those guys on the subway in self-defense but then he sees that that's the first thing he's done that's gotten him positive attention and then he's like well maybe that's what i should do I should just kill everybody they even have this shot where he like kills the talk show host and then it shows all the TV monitors picking up the story of what he just did and it's like, OMG, he's famous. And fine, you know, it's some kind of heavy-handed, oh, media, but the rest of the movie wasn't about that at all. And that wasn't part of Arthur's motivation, so what's the point of that? So anyway, that's not a thing. Like, Arthur notices the media coverage and he like smiles about it, but it doesn't drive any of his later actions. Each subsequent time he kills people, it's for reasons totally unrelated to that, usually just because they wronged him in some way. And until the final kill, he's not trying to get attention for it. Usually it happens somewhere in private, and then he tries to hide that he's done it. That's what's frustrating about Arthur's descent into madness, is it doesn't really feel like a descent, it's more like a point A, point B, and poignant dancing in the middle. <laughs> The Joker would like that. His reaction to different catalysts often feels arbitrary and not like it's a gradual progression at all. Like one bad thing will happen and he'll respond violently and then another equally bad thing will happen and he won't. It's frustrating to even try to articulate this because there's such an easy fallback for anyone trying to defend this movie against any criticism. They can just be like, he's not supposed to make sense. He's the Joker. He's crazy. And it's like, well, yeah, but in a character study movie, it's only interesting if you're willing to actually study the character. There has to be some kind of emotional core or sense to what they're doing. If you want to design a character who just kind of does stuff that doesn't make sense, that's fine, but not if they're the focal point of a character study, because then you just don't have that much of a movie. This motivation issue for me really came to a head in the big talk show scene, which I feel like is the scene that everybody's going to be talking about. I'm already irritated by this scene because suddenly Arthur is like cool and confident and doesn't really display his nervous laughter tick for much of it. And sure, that's supposed to convey that he's transformed or whatever. But an earlier scene goes out of its way to imply that Arthur isn't really mentally ill in like a brain chemistry kind of sense. And all of his psychological problems are implied to be strongly linked to this head trauma he received as a child when he was abused by his mother's abusive boyfriend, which, by the way, is framed as his mother's fault. So if this is all the result of some kind of physical lesion in his brain, I don't understand how some kind of aha moment where he decides to be a murderer is going to suddenly cure his inability to present as normal in social settings. But anyway, this scene is where Arthur is basically saying his thesis to the audience, and it's a mess. It's all over the place. Right out the gate, Arthur, it's very heavy-handed, he comes out and sits on the couch and tells an inappropriate joke. It's like a mean-spirited knock-knock joke about someone's son dying in a drunk driving accident. And they've written in this pearl-clutching old lady character to sit next to Arthur, and it's so heavy-handed. She goes, you can't joke about that. What a mean, offensive thing to tell jokes about. And this was the worst moment of my viewing experience. This was the moment I had my own Arthur-style delusion in which Todd Phillips was sitting next to me and like nudging me with his elbow and being like, do you understand? See, writer-director Todd Phillips has been going on every interview for the last several months and like complaining about how he can't make another hangover-esque movie because people are too easily offended by his jokes these days. As if there aren't a million movies getting made every day that are equally as trashy as his hangover movies and that there isn't a huge thriving audience for them. I'm sorry, I have no strong feelings about The Hangover. I haven't seen any of them. They might be funny. They probably are. They made a lot of money. I look like Bilbo Baggins. <laughs> it's just when I hear a comedian say, nobody likes my jokes because they're offended, my brain just filters that so all I hear is nobody likes my jokes. Which is a good warning to receive from a comedian. I already thought it was weird that he was complaining about that so much because like what does that have to do with Joker, the film that he's promoting? And the answer is it has nothing to do with the Joker. There's nothing at all to do with that. Arthur's comedy career is not failing because his jokes are too offensive. He's not failing because he tells off-color jokes he's failing because he has brain damage. The few clips we see of his comedy performances, he's bombing because he has an uncontrollable laughter tick that happens when he's nervous. His jokes aren't inappropriate. They're like 
baby joke book jokes. They're almost tragic in how earnest and childish they are. But no, they have the old lady say that, and then in his speech, Arthur is even like, you decide what's right and wrong, just like you decide what's funny and what's not. And it's like, ah. <laughs> Having this weird, you can't joke about that grandmother sitting next to Arthur on the talk show and having that be the thing that kicks off this confrontation is just the moment that writer-director Todd Phillips comes out of the screen like a 3D movie to complain to you about his career. The whole speech is just a hot mess. You can't have it both ways. You can't make a movie about a mentally ill man's tragic descent into further madness and then also have an ending where he gives a big coherent speech where he's a mouthpiece for you, the writer-director about how nobody wanted a fourth hangover movie. And then in this very same scene where you have the Joker parodying the exact thoughts and feelings of the director as expressed in every interview, you also have a line where he says, what do you get when you cross a mentally ill loner with a society that ignores him and treats him like trash? You get what you deserve. And then he shoots the talk show host in the head and it's like, well, does the writer director also believe this? Is this what the movie's about? Is it in support of the Joker shooting the host in the head? Because contextually, it kind of seems that way. So aside from the poor implications of that line, I also just don't like that line. I think it's messy and I will explain. I just think it feels clumsy and unrealistic for a mentally ill movie character to outright state that they are mentally ill in order to give some kind of movie thesis statement. I also think it's weird that even though he's like in full Joker mode and shooting people, he says mentally ill instead of crazy as though not wanting to offend anybody. Anyway, for me, the only redeeming quality of that scene is that the Joker uses werewolf as a verb. I love that. I feel like I say this about so many movies, but like, what was the theme? What was it about? It sure presents itself as though it has something to say, and it half says many things, but it doesn't commit to any of them. Is it about the unfairness of class disparity? Thomas Wayne definitely seems pretty generically evil. I mean, he's confronted by a seemingly non-violent, mentally ill man, and he punches him in the face and he calls poor people clowns on the news. That's what incites all those riots, which are kind of a focal point of the movie. But Arthur has that whole bit on the talk show where he insists that, at least according to him, he's not political, didn't mean to become a symbol for that movement, doesn't have strong feelings about it one way or the other, but then he contradicts that by getting mad at Thomas Wayne for not caring about the little guy. So I guess he does support that movement, but then why not just say he supports the movement? He's He has an opportunity, he has a platform to say it, and why not kill Thomas Wayne when he had the chance? If he's violent now, he kills the talk show host instead for being mean to him which is a pretty feeble reason. He just kills mean people, that's his thing. If we are meant to believe Arthur that he doesn't stand for anything, which I think is kind of a big if, is that what the movie's about? Is it about how violent criminals are just unhinged, shouldn't be looked to as, as heroes or symbols? But then why does he get to have a big speech at the end of the movie about how the world has wronged him? Why suddenly make him capable of delivering a coherent mission statement at the moment in the film that he's supposed to be the craziest? Is it literally just a deconstruction of bad Batman. They have this line at the beginning where the news stations are talking about this epidemic of giant super rats because like no one's been cleaning up the garbage, the city keeps getting worse, the rats are getting bigger and meaner and scarier. And then one of the hosts jokes that the way to take care of the super rats is now they're gonna bring in super cats. And it's like a meta commentary on Batman, like he's a band-aid solution, he doesn't actually fix what's wrong. You bring in a Batman to beat up the criminals, you don't address why there's so much crime, you don't address the class disparity in Gotham City, whatever. This is not a new concept. If anything, this is like baby's first Batman critique. It's been talked to death and it's like, yeah, that's what happens when you try to make serious movies out of like a thing made for kids. 80 years ago or whatever. So maybe that's part of the theme because like Arthur isn't actually getting any treatment that he needs when he's sick. It's not until he manifests as like violently crazy and then he's just arrested and taken away like the cat solution. But why give Arthur that line where he says he found things easier when he was still locked up? as if he's in favor of that solution? Why allude to the Charlie Chaplin movie with the same kind of plot element? 
Like, is him being locked up bad or good? Why don't I get to watch a scene where Arthur has to ward off a three foot long super rat with a baseball bat? You promised me super rats. Bring me the super rats. Is the movie really about the underfunding of mental health care? Because even when Arthur was in treatment, his doctors seemed apathetic, it didn't appear to be helping, and they even suggest that when he's off meds, he's healthier and more coherent and more in control of himself. And it's like, what? So is the message nobody should be on meds? Are they always a negative? And why make a point to clarify that Arthur has physical brain damage? Is that to also support the idea that he shouldn't be on meds and meds are bad? Why have that whole theme of Arthur trying to present as normal? We have that line in his notebook that they zoom in on where it says, the worst part about having a mental illness is people expect you to behave as if you don't. So is the message to embrace the idea of people having strange tics or social disorders and not expect a degree of normalcy because that's fine, but that can't be the theme because for Arthur, accepting himself and liking who he is directly correlates to him murdering people. So I hate to say it, but given the choice between murdering people and conforming, I personally would kind of prefer that Arthur conform. Maybe I'm alone in this. The movie gives so many of its characters statements that sound like they're the theme about like, what's wrong with society, what needs to be fixed, but then it can just as easily back away from any of them by being like, well, that wasn't the good guy, or that character's crazy. And it's like, well, then say something. There was so much talk around this movie about how it's going to encourage mass murderers or incel murderers or whatever. Same thing, I guess. And I don't know, time will tell, I guess, but honestly, this movie is so devoid of a message and such a blank slate that, yeah, I guess people could just make it be about whatever they want it to be. And it doesn't really mean it's guilty of that. It just means that it's irresponsibly vague and like weirdly unnecessary. I will say this, when I saw the movie, I didn't get to hear any kind of audience reactions because I saw it enclosed in my car at a drive-in movie theater because I didn't want to get shot. But then in order to talk about this movie, I felt like I had to look it up and like rewatch certain scenes primarily the talk show scene because it's so dialogue heavy and because it feels like it's given a lot of importance by the movie. So anyway, I looked up a lot of like fan cams of it and you can hear the audience reactions in that. And I was a bit surprised. There were like three different uploads of varying quality. And in every single one, at the moment that he shoots the talk show host, you literally hear dudes like, clapping and in one of them the guy behind the camera is even like that was great haha <laughs> that was so great and it's like what I'll tell you what you're doing. Call the police I'm not trying to say that makes you a murderer because it definitely doesn't, but it does kind of suggest that you can't follow the emotional cues of any story more complex than like Iron Man. Like you sat through that whole Joaquin Phoenix performance and you made it to like the 110 minute mark still thinking this was some kind of feel good underdog story. Did you process that as a triumphant scene? Do you think things are gonna go well for Arthur from here? What were those people even doing for the rest of the movie? Were they just sitting there like bored out of their skulls? Like, what we're action scene? When Joker fight Batman? Oh, I also don't like that scene at the end where it cuts to him in a bright hospital and he's like talking to a therapist and it's ambiguous as to whether or not the whole movie happened. Aha! I bet like at least 20 of you thought I wasn't gonna mention that and your typing fingers were warming up. You were gonna be like, it doesn't have to make sense because the story might not be true. Of course his story was maudlin or lacked internal consistency or didn't have a point. It's a story invented by a madman. Or depending upon my preference as a commenter, maybe part of the story happened and other parts didn't happen and I can just selectively decide and keep the ones I liked and get rid of the ones I didn't and that's how movies work now. But no, and this is what I'm talking about. This is the same thing as having the Joker outright say he's not political and then making a movie with many implied political themes and then also having him do a mission statement at the end. You're doing like a cop-out thing and you're affording yourself enough deniability that if any part of the movie doesn't make sense, you can be like, well, it wasn't supposed to. But then why did you make your movie? It's disingenuous to claim that it doesn't have any point because you made it for some reason, but like you're just afraid to commit to what it is. What's the point of the framing narrative?
narrative and the unreliable narrator thing. Even if we assume this whole movie was a delusion or like willfully made up by the Joker, does that inform us of something in his worldview or like give us new insight into the story? That might have even been an interesting framing narrative if they set it up earlier or like did cutaways to it where he's talking to the therapist princess bride style and then maybe through the telling of the story you can get some kind of hint of maybe what would compel the Joker to make it up like what his motives are, what, what emotional impact he's trying to have, or like maybe even the therapist could start noticing inconsistencies in the story or like commenting on them to make the audience start to doubt themselves and doubt the truth of what they're seeing. Like how cool would it be if you have this love interest character, the Sophie character, and she's like in the movie and then at the halfway point suddenly she's still there but everybody's calling her Cheryl and like you notice or like the therapist notice and it's like, I thought her name was Sophie. What, did you make that person up? What's going on? I don't know, I feel like if you already decide that you want your framing narrative to be crazy guy telling a story, there are ways to own it and have it improve the story in some way, but saving it for the very end, like it's supposed to be some kind of big shocking twist reveal, it, it just falls flat because it's just not a good twist. Like the story is about a mentally ill character, he's already had delusions in the rest of the story, so like you can see it coming from a mile away. and. Also, like, that's been done so many times. It's just so old hat. Is that mixing my metaphors to say old hat now? It's like an old hat that you can see from miles away. The biggest, oldest hat. And in this instance, it feels like an even bigger cop-out than it would be in any other movie. If the narrative had served to convince you of some very specific theme or some very specific characterization of the Joker to get attached to, it might have kind of worked as like a slap in the face to find out he's either malicious or crazy and it's not true, but instead the rest of it's so unfocused you're just kind of like, okay. Like for example, if the Joker's actions had followed some kind of internal logic and they had been presented in a way where they seemed to us to make sense in his very specific situation, like, oh, he was a victim of circumstance. Oh, he's just misunderstood. He had no choice. And the movie's totally taken you in, like you're really feeling for the Joker. Then at the end you're like, oh, he really pulled the wool over our eyes. But instead it's just a story told by a crazy man wherein he acts like a crazy man. Look, Doc, this may shock you because I'm in an asylum for the criminally insane, but my origin story is I was insane and then I became a criminal. You're like, all right. I guess that checks out. Ultimately, if you do believe that everything the Joker is saying is true, you have just been convinced that the Joker is crazy. And if you don't believe that the story is true, then the story has just informed you that the Joker is crazy. Why give the story a framing narrative as like a twist ending if it literally doesn't matter? I guess it was a cool last line. I mean, I can't begrudge it that. It was a cool last line. This movie actually had a lot of cool lines, like just good one-liners, but also most of them were in the trailer. The trailers had better music too. I guess that's my review is like, if you saw the trailers and you were intrigued, then like just rewatch the trailers. It's a better experience than watching the whole movie. It doesn't take as long. It's free. It's fine. But if you're like me and you just like to sit in the safety of your own car and eat movie theater, your popcorn and then like knock yourself out. I'm not going to be too hard on it because I don't think it was meant to be that shocking of a twist, but they have that reveal midway through where they find out that all of the Joker's dates with Sophie have been like delusions or daydreams or something. And like, dude, I promise you, every woman in the theater knew it was fake as soon as she agreed to a first date where she went to watch him do stand-up comedy at an open mic night. Do you know how many years of goodwill you have to build up for me to go watch you do stand-up comedy at an open mic night?